So our topic is worker voice and political participation in civil society. And I will, uh, this is co-authored with Ryan Lamar, who's also here this morning. Um, and so I'll do the first part and then I'll hand over to Ryan more in the middle. Um, so our motivation here is, you know, unlike Las Vegas, what happens in the workplace doesn't necessarily stay in the workplace. Right? There's a, a long distinguished body of, of work, um, some of it more conceptual or hypothetical, some of it more empirical, right, trying to, uh, you know, sort of uh, make this point, um, right, some very distinguished scholars, um, influential thought leaders, Adam Smith, Karl Marx, John Stuart Mill, right, in, in various ways all talked about possible connection spillovers from the workplace um, beyond and so, you know, the more recent literature sort of takes this up in a more focused way um, and looking at is there a relationship between what happens in the workplace in terms of voice, and that could be non-union voice, individual voice, could be union voice, and what happens in the political civic arenas, uh, are union members more likely to vote is maybe one of the most concrete questions, but as you'll see, we, we take a broader approach here. Um, and, you know, the typical mindset, you know, if you take my arrow on the screen here, literally, right, is more of a causal relationship. Um, voice causes uh, people to vote more frequently or to donate to charity or whatever your measure of political and civic participation is. Um, and we will try to keep that in mind. We, we, we definitely keep that in mind throughout our chapter. We'll, we'll try to keep that in mind, as you'll see, as we go through our presentation here as well. Um, you know, and the punchline is, you know, as in a lot of other literatures, right, there's sort of, um, you know, mixed success in terms of how much we can really account for causality versus other sort of non-causal explanations. Um, but, but the literature is definitely aware of that, which is, which is a good thing. Um, so, you know, there's a, a broad literature here. Um, it's very multidisciplinary. There's economists, sociologists, political scientists, industrial relations scholars, some psychologists who are engaged in different parts of this literature. Um, unlike maybe the segmentation that Francis talked about in terms of job quality, um, there does seem to be more integration here, which is good. Um, um, and we try to take a broad approach in our chapter, right? So some of it is more non-union based. Uh, think about individuals experiencing just more autonomy or self-determination in the workplace, or those experiencing more collective forms of voice in their workplace. Um, and there's uh, lots of theorizing and empirical work connecting that to things like, did these are these individuals more likely to vote than uh, people who haven't experienced these uh, degrees of non-union or collective voice, um, did they engage in other types of civic or charitable activities? Um, so one aspect of our broad approach is both non-union as well as collective or union voice. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll short, I'll, you know, I, uh, sort of refer to collective voice uh, as labor unions as a shorthand. Um, it's, it's not the only way. Um, other presentations have mentioned works councils. There might be a, some kind of similar effect there or worker centers. Labor unions doesn't have to be the only form of collective voice, but it's perhaps the, the clearest and um, I'll just use that as a shorthand. Um, um, but there can also be more aggregate effects of labor unions beyond just sort of these individual effects. And, and so that's part of our broad approach as well. Um, and so that's how we structure our chapter, more sort of conceptual, methodological discussion than uh, appraising the individual le level evidence as well as appraising the aggregate level evidence and sort of, you know, how we'll structure the rest of our presentation here, but obviously we don't have time to go into all of these aspects. So we'll try to pick out some highlights. Um, so just quickly, if we think about, you know, why might there be a relationship um, between the workplace and broader society, um, right? One place that people have started, if you think about individuals who have more autonomy in their workplace, um, they're able to make more decisions, have input into decisions, right? The idea is that can develop attitudes of confidence, feelings of agency, 
give workers more desire for controlling things, having input into things. Um, and it also might develop skills, um, negotiation skills, communication skills, problem solving skills. Um, and that these types of attitudes and skills might also come through participation in union activities, other forms of workplace voice. Okay, so what does that have to do with political arena or civic arena? Well, the basic argument here is that these attitudes can also then spill over into the political arena, uh, feelings of agency in the workplace, want me to have more input or uh, give me more confidence um, in participating in the political arena or the civic arena, advocacy skills, communication skills, those skills can translate into the political arena as well. And so that's the basic sort of spillover model with these two main categories of mechanisms or channels. One is the creation of certain types of attitudes, other is creation of skills. Um, now a couple uh, quick notes here, right? this might be context dependent, and for the most part these channels are sort of unintentional. Um, managers aren't giving workers more voice because they expect this to create political skills or political attitudes, um, right? It's just sort of a happy byproduct. If, if it happens, it's a happy byproduct. Um, but unions can also be intentional, right? There's get out the vote drives and, you know, drives to, um, you know, get union members to contact politicians, um, have rallies, unions can have political activist training, um, and there's even some um, more ambitious efforts to actually help uh, union members or other interested workers um, run for run for political office. So there can also be very intentional efforts. And again, unions don't have to be the only institutions of collective voice doing this. Maybe they're just the most obvious. Okay, so then the typical methodology is uh, at a micro level, collect a bunch of data, right? You can see whether they have access to non-union voice or whether they're a union member or not, things like that. Collect some measures or one measure, depending on your study. On the political side, did you vote is the most obvious measure, but there's lots of other things, right? And then, you know, run a regression and people um, with varying levels of union voice, right? Is there a positive relationship to likelihood of voting or contacting a politician or something like that? Um, and again, you know, the assumption here is that it's causal, but of course, just, you know, correlation does not prove causality, right? So this raises um, some key methodological challenges, right? Perhaps the most important being, you know, trying to really pin down causality. And so something that we do in the paper we find useful um, is to, you know, make it clear that there could be a variety of sort of relationships here that would yield this type of empirical relationship, um, but doesn't necessarily imply a causal relationship. Um, and we're not going to be able to distinguish all of these different um, possibilities, um, but we think it's important to be very clear about the different possibilities. Um, and just quickly, uh, another methodological challenge that runs throughout the literature is even, um, even if we can pin down a causal relationship, um, it's much more difficult to tease out, you know, is it the skills channel, is it the attitudes channel, or is it specific skills, specific attitudes, um, right? and so that's something that the literature has wrestled with. Um, and then there's also heterogeneous effects that the literature needs to pay attention to. And Ryan will pick up with a quick review of the evidence. So yeah, thanks. I'll uh, I'll just go uh, quickly through um, some of the studies in in sort of three broad areas. The first is the idea of uh, connecting individual voice to civic participation, and here we see sort of two large waves uh, that occurred. The first happened in the 1980s and 1990s. And by and large, it, uh, this uh, consisted of a lot of small scale studies. Um, folks like Eldon in 1981, for instance, looked at one non union factory in the U.S and tried to connect uh, one sort of core area, largely job autonomy or work autonomy, to feelings of 
a uh, stronger political advocacy. Uh, Smith in 1985, similarly, uh, sort of interviewed uh, workers in 55 companies and, you know, found spillover from autonomy to uh, political efficacy. Uh, Greenberg looked at, you know, 15 lumber mills and also found, you know, re representative and direct voice had, um, you know, effects on political participation. So that was the first wave in this broad topic. Uh, the second wave, uh, I should say, the the uh, one of the biggest sort of concerns here of the, of the first wave was that, it, you know, we have representation issues. Uh, and these studies largely came out of the US climate. Um, so the second wave corrected for this. And the second wave uh, looked more comparative, um, uh, was uh, quite European in focus, um, and had a much uh, more sort of um, quantitative approach, uh, broad quantitative approach to what it was doing. So um, larger in scale using sort of classic regression approaches. So we have folks like Lopez looking at 15 European countries and looking at, uh, auto again, autonomy and their effects on civic behavior. Uh, Timming and Summers looking at 27 European countries and again, looking at, at autonomy and its effects on uh, things like commitment to, to democracy. And then John and I looked at um, various political acts, uh, not just uh, autonomy, but a, a variety of different actions uh, politically, um, and finding that we find that you know strong evidence of worker voice uh, related to these eight political actions: voting, contacting politicians, boycotting, being a member of a political party, and the like. Um, so the, all of this basically uh, results in a, in a sort of overall uh, contribution, which suggests that um, there's a strong uh, there's strong evidence uh, showing that uh, direct participation in workplace decision-making is uh, positively related to spillover behaviors. And a meta-analysis in 2020 really highlighted that, uh, that nicely, um, clearly showing uh, these effects. Um, so the big concern here is uh, around these wave two studies is the idea of causality. And so, you know, one of the big arguments uh, is that a lot of these data weren't panel in nature and um, uh, we can't know, you know, what causal direction is going. And so, so a, an individual admin looked at this and, you know, found that maybe the evidence wasn't as strong as we would have thought if you account for causal mechanisms. Um, so uh, so uh, one of the big concerns there is how do you overcome that? And so John and I uh, tried to use like instrumental variables to try and overcome some of the problems of causality. Uh, there are also problems around mechanisms as well here. So what is the, what exactly is the mechanism that's leading from uh, individual voice to civic participation? And all studies seem to struggle with sort of directly picking this up. Um, okay, so then uh, so the you have four minutes left. Got it. No problem. So, uh, so just uh, briefly, two more uh, broad areas that we cover is the uh, rather than looking at individual direct voice, you can also look at the effect of union voice on a specific action like voter turnout. So there's an argument that uh, unions engage in what can be thought of as a vote premium, uh, sort of like a wage premium, but for voting. Lots of studies have looked at this, uh, and they find that you know union members are more likely to vote than are comparable non-members. Um, this is um, you know sort of a, a, an interesting finding because it has a, a range of outcome possibilities depending on what you account for. So uh, the range can go from anywhere between four to eighteen percent as a union vote premium effect, uh, but a lot of this is going to depend on whether you consider some of the um, sort of methodological challenges uh, around um, around the vote premium concept, which I'll talk about in, a, in just a second. Um, in addition to the union vote premium, we also see that union members vote differently from non-members in terms of who they vote for. So union members vote typically for more left-wing social democratic parties and candidates. Um, but we see that this is actually weakened a little bit. Um, that was a really common finding in previous studies, but it's weakened a little bit in recent studies as well. So some of the methodological concerns that have led to our, you know, sort of challenges or weakening of these uh, interpretations 
questions. Uh, the first is the idea of mechanism. So basically, the union vote premium can be at least partly explained as uh, mechanistically as an income effect. So, um, you know, if, if uh, union members are higher income, higher income folks vote more. Uh, so it might not be a direct union effect. It might be actually um, ascribed more to in income differences. Although we find that um, union vote premiums decline after accounting for income, they don't necessarily go away completely. So that was what um, Alex Bryson's work tended to show in the European context. Um, other concerns on this uh, in this area are uh, causal in nature, selection problems. So um, union members might select themselves into union membership based on their higher in political engagement, awareness of politics, and they might then vote more. Um, so uh, folks like uh, Hazi Abdik and uh, Bakaro tried to deal with this uh, problem uh, and, and found, you know, anticipation effects also help, uh, help explain the results. And then the last uh, uh, point here is that we get uh, significantly, um, you know, significantly critical examinations arguing that actually maybe some of these connections are a little bit weaker given the rise of extremism, political extremism, and union member likelihood to be voting for extremist parties. Lena Renwald's work um, picks up this thread in particular. So the very last thing that, uh, that we just want to highlight here is, you know, after you have these sort of individual um, effects on things like voter turnout and what have you, can you aggregate those up into wider political um, uh, influence. And we argue that in the in the uh, paper that yes, you can actually, you know, create sort of a or a reshape uh, political thinking uh, by doing things like um, creating a working class electorate, having strongly politically educated uh, workers that then go out and vote in certain ways that can sort of change the democratic character of, of, a, of a political institution. Uh, but a lot of this might depend on political systems at play, what the characteristics of those systems are. John and I looked in particular at uh, at how um, more representative uh, political systems might shape um, attitudes toward unions. Um, and, you know, f we found that the political system matters a lot in the aggregate and shaping these aggregate results. Um, by and large, we see, you know, more representative systems yield more union influence. And we also uh, uncovered some evidence that, you know, even in uh, authoritarian or autocratic environments, we can see that unions uh, can play a role in building democracy. Um, union members can go out and, um, you know, uh, engage in protest activities or um, other types of um, uh, actions that can shape the, uh, dem the democratic nature of these systems. A couple of methodological concerns. One big one is, is causality here. Again, we don't necessarily know that the, what the causal direction uh, is with, with uh, the relationship between unions and uh, aggregate democratic societies. Um, and two others, you know, there's a contingency effect. You know, not all unions are going to be sort of overtly positive or overtly democratic in nature. Some unions are anti-democratic. So we can't assume all unions are going to do this. Um, and, you know, some of these studies are, are quite localized. So there's generalizability concerns um, around these issues. So just in conclusion, to very uh, briefly wrap up, um, what we see by and large is that, you know, th these studies suggest we shouldn't um, overlook the effects of individual and collective voice on civic engagement. Spillovers seem to matter from the workplace into the political arena, and unions can be quite intentional also in how they shape political climates. Uh, we see a lot of um, scholarship on this area, which allows us to have some high confidence in the sort of relationship between uh, workplace effects and political and civic effects across a variety of countries. But we can't conclude uh, with high confidence that this relationship is causal in nature. Uh, rather, um, you know, we have to account for things like causal possibilities um, and other um, endogeneity issues issues in this relationship. And so we have lower confidence uh, that, uh, that we're able to isolate specific mechanisms or channels. We can sort of identify the higher level mechanisms, um, but we, it's much harder to get to the lower level mechanisms and to have sort of direct evidence. So finally, just to conclude, um, we can argue that the accumulated uh, research that we have here um, is you know, better at identifying the ways 
uh, in which uh, we see uh, worker voice shaping political engagement rather than identifying you know, specific dominant transmission channels or certain mechanisms and ruling out others.